welcome to the third uh, Pipeline for Youth Health speaker series. I'm super excited about our guest tonight, um, Dr. Jordan Steiner. Um, and our very own Dr. Liz Matthews actually uh, is familiar with her work and um, knows her. Um, so I am going to pass off the introduction to Dr. Matthews and we will get right into it. Okay. Hello everybody, good to see you all tonight. Um, so I am very excited to be able to introduce Dr. Jordan Steiner. Um, not just because she and I share a social work alma mater, um, but also because I think she is going to give such a great um, background and introduction to kind of how social work careers can emerge and progress um, and is bringing what I think is going to be a really unique and valuable perspective to some of the conversations we've been having, which is a real international and global perspective around sexual violence and sexual violence prevention. Um, so with that informal introduction, um, I'm going to formally introduce Dr. Steiner, just giving you a little bit of background on um, some of her work so far. Um, Dr. Steiner is currently serving as an evaluator at the New Jersey Department of Children and Families. Um, she recently graduated from um, Again, my alma mater from the PhD program at Rutgers University in social work. Um, so her educational background is in both social work and education. She's worked in refugee, immigrant, and humanitarian response and services, both internationally and domestically, as well as working as a researcher on gender-based violence and an evaluator for sexual violence prevention. Her evaluation and research interests focus on gender-based violence among diverse populations, refugees and immigrants, and language justice with a particular focus on investing, investigating sexual violence experiences, their impact and prevention through the socio-ecological perspective, um, which I know we're gonna hear about today, um, in particular focusing on adolescents and young adults. Uh, prior, to, uh, prior to this, her work has included positions at the Center for Violence Against Women and Children, International Rescue Committee, International Catholic Migration Commission, UNICEF, and the YMCA New Americans Welcome Center. So you can see she has a breadth of experience to bring with her today. She's also served as a Peace Corps volunteer um, in West Africa and has served both as an educator working closely in girls' education, empowerment, and health projects. So a lot of ground to cover. Welcome, Dr. Steiner. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. Um, before I hand over the mic officially, um, I just wanted to let you all know I'm gonna be helping to facilitate some Q&A at the end. Um, I know there may be some instances throughout where Dr. Steiner might kind of ask you all some questions to participate um, and let you engage a bit. But if you have general questions about her work and some of these experiences, if you can hold them to the end, I'm gonna be moderating the chat and then we'll also kind of help facilitate some Q&A at the end. So we have plenty of time for some great discussion after she presents a little bit about her work. Um, so with that, um, thank you again, Dr. Steiner, and I'm gonna hand the mic over to you. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Matthews and Dr. Ross for, for having me. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here with all of you and with all of the fellows. Um, so I am going to share my screen and then of course ask if you can see my screen um, without the notes as one always does. Okay, can you see my screen? just the screen. Okay, fantastic. Great. So, you know, just coming in from Dr. Matthews' introduction, um, really my discussion today is going to be utilizing the socio-ecological model as a framework for sexual violence research, response, and prevention through a public health approach. Um, and I say this fully understanding, you know, I, my background is in social work, you all are in social work school, but as I understand it as well, you all are really interested in looking at kind of intersectoral and interprofessional um, work and how that kind of applies. And so a lot of what I'm talking about 
is how kind of the sociological model and similar frameworks and a lot of the research and work that I've done and how I kind of came to my work and my current work is really framed by this and about thinking how different sectors and different professions kind of work together to respond and to prevent gender-based violence. <clears throat> so the agenda for the discussion is I'm just going to kind of go over some general areas of my work and how I'm, I'm thinking about it within this framework I'm discussing and what I believe is going to be most relevant to you. The process of my research and career and again how um, kind of thinking within this framework really led me to where I am and the type of work that I do, both in a research sense and a practice sense and in a professional sense. Um, and again, so this is really starting off with sexual violence related research, utilizing the socioecological model and its application to adolescents and young people. Um, so thinking about social work and kind of other sectoral work um, in this work of sexual violence related research within this framework. And then sexual violence prevention with adolescents and adults and really in an applied setting. So how is sexual violence prevention and evaluation work um, being done and thinking about how different sectors work together um, and thinking about how we're thinking about um, experiences and adverse experiences from people and how we can prevent these experiences from happening and thinking about their consequences. So um, the kind of general areas of my work in the application to prevention and interprofessional work, like I said, is a socioecological model as a framework for really understanding the causes of gender-based violence. So kind of what are some inner, inner like underlying kind of like risk and protective factors, sexual violence and the consequences of this violence, um, which I think is critical when we're thinking about um, especially adverse childhood experiences and that adolescents and children may go through and the consequences and how we respond to these consequences. Um, and socioecological model as a framework for sexual violence prevention. Um, and, you know, I really specialized in my um, recent career in research on violence against women and children, particularly among more kind of under, underserved or historically um, represented communities, as Dr. Matthew said, with refugees, immigrants, et cetera. And so really thinking about kind of within both of within a research framework and a practice frame, framework, how we're considering um, all of these populations for prevention with a focus on interprofessional, interprofessional and intersectoral work. So, you know, to really kind of give a background, um, and I know a little bit was in my bio, but kind of how I got to where I was, I just wanted to kind of review a few things, which I think then informs, um, you know, how, um, again, I'm thinking about the research and the practice that I'm involved in. Um, so really, how I got here was, um, you know, after college, I joined the Peace Corps, and I ended up serving in Benin, West Africa. Um, I was teaching English as a foreign language in the Peace Corps, and it was actually um, a tragedy in service during my time there related to gender-based violence in schools against adolescents that really cemented my interest in understanding and responding to gender-based violence, particularly related to adolescents and adolescent girls. And I really became interested, you know, kind of working within the education sector there, but also working then within kind of health and, and, uh, and other things um, in understanding how, you know, response services can be working with teachers, um, can be working with the health sector, et cetera. And I began to think about like, what are ways that, um, you know, communities and organizations can be thinking about, again, how we're responding and preventing to gender-based violence where, you know, certain, um, really adverse situations are happening and it's not just kind of left to the education system or just the social work system to, to respond to an experience of violence um, experienced by a girl. What do you want to have on? Um, so I can hear a lot of background noise. I don't know if everybody can mute. That, that would be awesome. We'll probably take questions for later, but that would be great. Thank you. Um, and so after this, I actually, I returned and I studied for a master's in international education while, like I said, I began a career in refugee and immigration work, humanitarian international development work, et cetera. And even here as well, um, working both internationally and domestically, you know, it really became quite clear how important it was to understand a person in the environment, kind of this person and environment, um, socio-ecological um, frame that we are becoming, you know, more 
familiar with in social work um, and thinking about community organizations, culture, schools, norms, policies, and still noticing how um, sectors, again, were not necessarily working together and wanting to commit to um, a career and to a discipline that really was committed to um, thinking about things within an environment, thinking about community and social norms and how a person is within their environment and how, again, um, different levels of the socio-ecological framework, again, are kind of working together to respond to violence. Um, because as I was seeing, things were kind of happening and there wasn't enough uh, kind of work being done together in order to, to think about these things holistically. So these experiences motivated me to pursue my PhD. And like I said, and you know, I think I've made the argument enough, I wanted to go specifically into social work, specifically into social work because of that holistic and social justice focus. I actually, like I said, got a master's in international education, but you know, it wasn't enough, right? Like there needed to be more of a discussion of how social service sectors were talking to education sectors that were talking to justice, that were talking to health, et cetera. And social work really, I think, provided the frameworks um, and um, kind of the setting to be able to do that, that I was really inspired by. And so, as Dr. Matthew said, I ended up pursuing an MSW and PhD at um, Rucker School of social work, social work, where I worked as a um, research associate, associate and evaluation supervisor at the Center on Violence Against Women and Children, where I ended up being able to do um, and participate in a lot of research projects specifically focused on campus violence response and prevention, um, domestic violence and welfare, um, some other international work in, in Liberia, looking at violence against um, school children there, trafficking. And again, a lot of this work was thinking about um, you know, how different um, networks and um, sectors are working together with social work to, to be responsive. Um, and then I also was doing work, and I'll get into this a little bit later, as kind of a case study in kind of these examples I'm providing in, you know, kind of inner, um, inner professional, inner professional, interdisciplinary, intersectoral work that's focused on adolescents and young people um, was extending some kind of research and work in Benin. Um, and then another case study I'll talk about um, was my dissertation focused on sexual violence against girls in Malawi and mental health consequences. Um, as an example. And then, um, as was mentioned, for the past uh, two and a half years or so, I have been an evaluator um, at the New Jersey Department of Children and Families, where there's a real focus on um, sexual violence prevention and health equity. Um, again, really thinking about uh, the model within a public health approach, but really borrowing from the socio-ecological model um, and thinking about sexual violence prevention with a heavy focus, um, especially now, and I think this is what, what is interesting to think about kind of trends specifically with prevention and sexual violence prevention, a real big focus on the community and societal level um, to really better understand violence and the effects of potential um, prevention strategies. And again, this is specifically looking within the United States and domestic con uh, context. So before I kind of delve um, a little further, and so I'm just not talking, 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 I wanted to kind of hear from you on how, um, from what you know so far, and I'll delve into kind of the details of this a little bit more, um, but you know, so far in your training, how have you seen the applications specifically of the socio-ecological framework or related frameworks in your work on practice prevention and health equity with young people? I would just love to hear um, for, from, a few, from a few of you. Hi, I'd like to speak. Um, yeah, sure. I'm Maya, and um, my field placement is at uh, New York, the New York Fine Links Mother Child Program in the Bronx. And um, I was doing a research paper on my placement and about um, because the target population for the program is like teenage mothers in foster care. And so a lot of these girls have um, they've been like victims of sexual assault and violence. Um, and then they're young mothers with very young babies. And um, so I was doing research on that population. And I found that like a lot of programs, like the one that I'm at are trying to 
um, you know, specialize in sex education and contraceptive, contraceptive, uh, contraceptive education to mm-hmm. teach the girls about like birth control and things like that. So I talked to my field supervisor about that, and she said that the girls get that, that they get education on safe sex practices um, and contraceptives. So that's one type of prevention that my program works on. That's fantastic. And thanks for sharing that. And I think from what you're sharing too, and and thinking about, again, this kind of like multi-level approach in in working in prevention and response, et cetera, it sounds like with that as well, that there's a focus on like curriculum, right? And and I'll go into this a little bit more, um, but that's, I think, focusing very much, which is great, um, on the kind of individual level, um, like what do you know? What do you not know? Let's talk about um, education and then maybe assessing kind of from these discussions and from this curriculum and, and kind of any any kind of norm change and through that um, prevention at that level. So thanks for sharing that. That's, that's really interesting and kind of very applied um, work in terms of thinking about prevention and where that fits within the socio-ecological framework. And very much a like intersectoral, I would say, like it sounds like there's health Um, with social work as well, which is fantastic. Any other um, kind of thoughts? Rico? Oh, sorry. Uh, Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm sorry. I'm looking at two monitors here. Um, Oh, my. Don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) So it's a little lower the hand. Uh, Thanks so much. I'm actually at a placement where I get to look at uh, kind of a bunch of different um, programs. And so the one program I'm thinking about is um, called Aspire. It's um, essentially started as an after-school tutoring program, um, but has evolved over the years um, into much more than that. Um, It works primarily with students uh, facing a number of barriers to their academic success. like being from uh, an ethnic minority or um, uh, being eligible for free and reduced lunch, like that kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe uh, an I, you know, a learning disability or something like. Just there's a list that they kind of run through. Uh, but yeah. all that to say, um, I think the I've seen the program respond and and evolve in response to uh, and in, and in recognition of all the different factors that can impact the student's learning. And so now, um, I don't know how many years later, uh, the program is not just a tutoring program, but it um, works to provide students with all sorts of exposure to different um, social emotional Mm -hmm. learning opportunities. It works closely with parents, it works closely with teachers at the schools. Um, And even the schools even give the Aspire staff that operate offsite access into students like um the equivalent of the of the electronic medical record you know at school um so that they can work specifically with their students and look at their grades with them etc so um yeah anyway no no rico that's a that's a really great example and i I think it's actually really interesting because i'll get to this and like i think the second example i give about kind of the socio-ecological framework and violence etc um, is what you're talking about in many ways, and maybe you've heard of this, but um, I kind of came, came across this framework and how it applies to the socio-ecological framework a few years ago is like this whole school approach, right? Um, and working with parents and working, yeah, like you said, with the community, um, socio-emotional learning um, kind of with education, which is, a, I think, a, a beautiful, comprehensive, holistic approach that um, I think is gaining a lot more traction. It's definitely gaining a lot more traction internationally in thinking about violence prevention and education um, generally, but also I think um, domestically as well. So I think that's a fantastic example and one I'll delve a little bit more into, but um, is really kind of fits into, again, intersectoral, interprofessional, whole school kind of um, ideology as we think about prevention work and response work really. So I don't know if we have time for like one more small, small one. I'll go. Um, so 
my placement is at Elmhurst Hospital. Um, and the first thing I thought of was uh, domestic violence, people coming in for domestic violence. Um, of course, you're seeking the medical treatment that is needed, but it's also about educating them on the cycle of, of abuse so that um, they can further prevent it, uh, further prevent it from happening. Um, a lot of them are also undocumented. So of course, they're scared of coming in. So it's about providing them with proper information that lets them know that we're working with them and not against them. And then just connecting them with um, other social networks, such as domestic violence shelters or the legal system. Fantastic. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah, another great example, specifically when thinking about maybe more a little bit in the response, but same um, in thinking about, um, you know, again, different levels within the socioecological framework, other professions working together. So, you know, not just thinking about um, a domestic violence advocate, but how do they work with the justice system, et cetera. And again, um, to us as social workers, and especially within this like this fellows program, um, this might seem like, of course, but it's not really necessarily an of course, I think with all of this, that there's a lot of work out there that's not holistic, um, but I think that's what's really beautiful about social work and about especially thinking about interprofessional work. So I really appreciate all of those examples and hopefully even what I'm talking about will kind of contribute um, to what you all are thinking about. So thank you so much um, to the three of you for sharing. So um, again, kind of delving in okay, um, to some of these examples. And again, um, like I said, I'll use a few projects related to what I'm talking about that again are kind of in, not kind of, are um, set within an inter, uh, international setting, but I do think it's really relevant. And again, my kind of last kind of case study will be in New Jersey, right around the corner in a, in a domestic setting. Um, but I think when we can think about these international um, settings and really learn from um, international examples as well, and um, I think, so A, I think there's relevance there and B, you know, specifically, you know, at Fordham and in New York City, I assume so many of you are working with international populations. So thinking about um, frameworks and things being done in the international sphere, I think is really re relevant as you think about kind of international populations um, in kind of New York and beyond. So um, the first one that I'll talk about again, and this is sexual violence related research really utilizing the socioecological model and its application to adolescents and young people is um, the dissertation work that I did on the relationship between sexual violence and mental distress for female adolescents and young women in Malawi. And the second one um, is multi-level responses to sexual violence in schools in West Africa. And I'll get a, a little bit into the whole school approach as um, kind of discussed with Rico um, just a minute ago. So kind of within um, this project, I was really interested in thinking about um, the relationship between sexual violence experienced by female adolescents and young women in Malawi and their mental distress outcomes. Um, and without getting into too much detail, really what I was interested in is thinking about the different forms of sexual violence that adolescent girls were experiencing in Malawi from what we would consider um, uh, like maybe not as like aggressive, I guess, um, or severe experiences such as unwanted touching, attempted unwanted forced sex, all the way to kind of more like rape type experiences such as uh, pressured sex, I should not say press, say pressured sex and physically forced sex. And I, again, I think that this is relevant um, to thinking about the work that you're doing in that experiences of sexual violence are very much an adverse childhood experience. And I was specifically looking at the experiences of um, Malawian um, adolescents and young people from ages 13 to 24. And so even beyond thinking about this like continuum of sexual violence that they were experiencing, um, I was also looking at like the numbers of types of sexual violence experiences that they might be having and also thinking about these other, again, what you would probably term adverse childhood experiences um, other experiences of physical abuse, abuse going on in the homes, et cetera, and thinking about what are the mental health consequences of this. Um, and I, you know, I did this by utilizing a socio-ecological model to really look at the impact of sexual violence on adolescent girls' mental health um, in order to kind of fill this gap in literature, both 
that would contribute to, to work going on um, in the United States, but um, kind of also internationally as well. Um, and I, again, I think it's important to kind of point out um, this work and its kind of application to the type of work that you're thinking about doing to really think about um, recommending evidence, again, with that kind of person and environment framework um, for holistic and culturally relevant services to respond to the negative mental health um, effects of sexual violence trauma and to really think about adolescence development and well being um, and how how there can be kind of a holistic response to this in thinking about um, an experience of an adolescent girl kind of within their environment. And so, you know, I think because so much of, of what I'm talking about here, um, it's is kind of framed by this um, socio ecological framework that we're talking about that I'm assuming many of you are really um, familiar with, um, but I'll just kind of review really quickly and kind of show you how I kind of developed this framework a little bit more in thinking about, again, um, kind of the consequences of trauma, the response to trauma, and then that kind of brings us a little bit into prevention. Um, but just as a review, you know, many of you may know that this kind of socio-ecological framework, which is very popular in social work and in public health and in other kind of sectors, came out of developmental um, psychology and looks at these like different nested levels um, to look at the impact um, on individuals, peers, the broader social environment, and changes over time on development. And so again, um, there is this like individual level, which looks at the sociodemographic factors, the microsystem level, and looking at interactions between families, friends, and peers, the mesosystem level between individuals and systems, exosystem between organizations and social systems, um, and the chronosystem level, which I think is a level that doesn't always get a lot of attention, but is really thinking about a person in their environment um, and looking at it, experiences over time. And again, especially when you're thinking about working with adolescents and young people and adverse childhood experiences, such as different types of violence, this is particularly important to kind of think about um, and think about how to really critically think about this in response and prevention. And so kind of utilizing this framework um, because of my specific work within gender-based violence and interest in gender-based violence, um, I also kind of thought about and developed this framework in using some other, and this is a little bit difficult to read, um, some other work out there that's really been focused on gender-based violence and the causes of gender-based violence um, which really came from a very um, kind of international, even though it was, I guess, a domestic researcher context and thinking about the causes of gender-based violence and responses. And so, you know, even adding to this original model, and when we think specifically about gender-based violence, we also need to be taking into consideration a survivor's history, um, other experiences of violence and conflict, thinking about male dominance and how this contributes to gender-based violence and thinking about um, norms, et cetera. And, um, and then again, thinking about the links between gender-based violence and you know, child maltreatment, et cetera, which you know, many of you may be interested in as well. So I thought it was just important to kind of give that baseline, which I think um, you know, has informed a lot of my thinking again in causes, response, and prevention um, a lot of the type of work that, um, that I do, that people in the gender-based violence world do, especially within like public health and social work, and how specifically within gender-based violence, there are certain kind of um, frameworks that have developed um, that even kind of work off of this kind of original framework that's used in a lot of different parts of social work. So then again, specifically in the work um, investigating um, the experiences of sexual violence across kind of a life course. And again, these kind of these continuum of, of sexual violence and the mental health effects. Um, I specifically looked at individual factors. So thinking about sociodemographic um, uh, kind of characteristics, age, level of education, marital status, um, assault experiences, which again are kind of working off some of the kind of gender-based violence specific work and thinking about the, the victim offender relationship um, and then thinking at the microsystem level about um, 
kind of environmental poverty issues as well as um, social support system. And then again, that kind of chromal system level. How do we think about these adverse childhood experiences, these experiences of sexual violence and other types of violence that adolescent girls might be experiencing and think about kind of the mental health impacts um, in, in that setting. Um, so just wanted to kind of show you kind of the thought process and kind of the application to this specific work um, that again was looking at specifically sexual violence experiences of, um, of adolescent girls in Malawi, age 13 to 24. And kind of from, you know, without getting into the great details <laughs> of all of this work and research, but kind of, again, utilizing this as a case study and what we're talking about really came in terms of like thinking about and recommending and um, again, you know, maybe some thoughts about how this can even apply to your to your own work, um, kind of the immense need for culturally relevant social services to thinking about mental health consequences of sexual violence the need for very comprehensive service models. Again, you all gave some great examples, which um, I think just needs to constantly be discussed. Um, uh, so thinking about how services, and I think, you know, I think it was even you, Brenda, who were talking about how do we talk, we think about the justice system and social workers, et cetera, um, and think about, um, you know, really bolstering these types of services, which I already know, having worked in, to, in New York, um, services like this exist, but really increasing this both internationally and domestically. Again, this is not just like, an, of course, like that's not <laughs> really what's going on. Um, so as social workers, how do we advocate for that kind of interprofessional holistic work um, when we're thinking about the consequences within like um, somebody within a person and environment approach and their experiences and the consequences of particularly violence experiences. Um, and specifically in this context, um, in Malawi, village-based workers, which I think in some ways can be applied um, domestically, potentially in rural areas as well. Um, but how do we even think out sometimes outside of like the box of, of formal systems always, and how do we work with informal systems and formal systems in terms of response and prevention? So then the second example, again, that I'll kind of um, give from a little bit of an international um, perspective is, uh, you know, I've been working in Benin for over 10 years, um, again, kind of in the work emanating from sexual violence in schools, particularly thinking about teacher perpetrated sexual violence in schools. Um, and so I've done a lot of work specifically in Benin in, um, in Benin and then working with some other people in Burkina Faso, which is a country um, right next to it. Um, several years ago, talked to um, government representatives, teachers, um, local organizations, community organizations, students, et cetera, to really try to understand their perceptions of sexual violence in schools and teacher perpetrated sexual violence. And again, really kind of where I came to uh, to, to be thinking about this work is, is really this holistic socioecological fr framework, surprise, surprise, in this whole school holistic approach, right? Um, and I wanted to specifically show you um, this kind of circle right here is, is what we call kind of the whole school approach with which really emanates from the socioecological framework. But in thinking specifically in a lot of the work that you're doing, Again, it's a school-based intervention framework that draws from the socio-ecological model to promote the engagement of multiple stakeholders um, from families to social workers, to um, communities, to students, um, et cetera. And it really is a, an examination of interprofessional practice for health and well-being. And I have some arrows that point specifically to what um, I feel particularly within social work is particularly um, applicable. And again, I think that Rico, you gave a good example of this. And then this is particularly specifically thinking about um, gender-based violence. So um, thinking about incidence response. Um, so if there's an incidence of uh, gender-based violence in schools, whether that's perpetrated by a teacher or peers or et cetera, um, how do we have child centers procedure, procedures in place to respond um, to needs and referrals to local child protection systems, um, even if, if it's something's occurring right in school. Um, for reporting, monitoring, and accountability, how do we have confidential spaces for reporting experiences of gender-based violence? 
um, and school leadership and community engagement. Again, um, kind of repeating what I said, how do we have school principals, teachers, councils, parents work together to really be developing a whole school framework to prevent and respond and to be working together with the judiciary, child welfare agencies, et cetera. So the whole school approach really has gained, I've seen within like the really only like five or six years on the international sphere, a lot more traction. When I first became really interested in this work, I would say, I don't know, six or seven years ago, this was not being discussed, right? Like violence was happening in schools internationally and domestically, um, but people were not thinking intersectorally. They weren't thinking on how you have to work on codes of conduct with teachers, but also think about how to respond to incidences and also think about school leadership and community engagement. Um, and so I think that there's been a real opportunity specifically for social workers, um, at least on the international, and I think on the domestic kind of stage in our profession um, to be really engaging and thinking about these frameworks um, and how to do these with, um, just do them well. And so internationally, there's kind of minimum standards now on kind of the whole school approach, et cetera, which I think has been used more and more as well in the domestic sphere. And so particularly applied to this, this specific work and this research in, in, in Benin, um, you know, again, like I said, um, really kind of helps shift our level of analysis from individuals to collectives and how we need to direct research and prevention efforts. And so specifically, you know, I've gone on like on a discussion about specifically this, this framework and the whole school approach, but recommendations specifically to this work is again, understanding that local context must be understood to investigate meanings and belief around gender and sexuality. And that I think relates to even outside of gender-based work, but, uh, or gender-based violence work, but that is just a critical, critical um, part of understanding when you're doing this type of work um, what are the specific cultural um, norms and what do those meanings and beliefs mean and that we can't just assume what they mean. Um, and again, applying to culturally sensitive work in the United States um, and thinking about multiple levels of society presenting different risk factors and protective factors that you might not even know until you really delve in. Um, and that really specifically in this setting, for example, school related gender based violence is a complex phenomenon that involves you know, the communities and systems to respond. And again, um, with from what I have experienced and from the research that I've done um, now that the whole school approach, I think from a practice perspective and a research perspective is a, is a really strong framework kind of emanating from the socio-ecological framework in terms of um, applying to this kind of, of work. So then lastly, um, I'm just gonna get to, but definitely not least, <laughs> sexual violence prevention with adolescents and adults in kind of an applied setting, um, a case study specifically within um, New Jersey. And one thing I have to say is, you know, as I'm talking about this, I'm really just like my other kind of discussion and work that, I'm, that I've already talked about, um, kind of using this as kind of an overview case study. I'm not representing the CDC when I talk about this, the state of New Jersey, um, or their program. I'm just kind of, as I think about these frameworks, um, utilizing them as a case study here. So I just want to make sure that that's understood. Um, and I think this is just important to talk about um, in the sense of when we think about sexual violence prevention, specifically in the United States, that um, the socio-ecological model is really the framework for prevention with a major focus on the community and societal level. So, you know, we kind of talked about the macro systems and the exosystems. And um, when we're thinking about this within a kind of a public health framework for prevention, that really comes down to the community mm -hmm. level and the societal level, of course, the individual and the relationship. But I think that the direction that's happening specifically in um, sexual violence prevention work um, domestically is a really big focus on the community and societal level and trying to understand um, kind of where change can, can happen there. And um, this comes from a, you know, a big focus from the CDC on, I have some arrows here on youth violence, child abuse and neglect, child sexual abuse, sexual violence. And again, I think in many ways kind of relate to some of the work that you all are all doing on adolescents and young people. 
um, and adverse childhood experiences. Um, so just wanted to talk about how um, some of this work is specifically also being framed. Um, so I think this is a really good um, kind of resource. This is a resource that the National Sexual Violence Resource Center has put together, and this is like, you know, public, so anybody can, and I can kind of give the link later, that looks at the socioecological model and thinks about risk and protective factors, which, you know, some of you may be familiar with, but this really kind of drives a lot of the type of sexual violence prevention work that I think is happening, um, like across the United States. Um, with risk factors, thinking as, as we think about them specifically when we think about gender-based violence and sexual violence as sets of behaviors or conditions that increase the risk for sexual violence prevention. So specifically at the societal and community level, thinking about, again, social norms that support sexual violence, thinking about policies, thinking about crime, um, and at the community level, thinking about um, lack of employment, um, general tolerance of sexual violence, like within particular communities, however community is defined, and protective factors. Um, so at the community level, um, thinking about coordination of services, access to mental health, with protective factors as behaviors or conditions that reduce or buffer sexual violence perpetration. So as we, again, think about the socioecological model in this person and environment, what are these kind of like environmental, specifically at the social and community level, that are occurring and then therefore what kind of prevention mechanisms can be put in place specifically thinking about sexual violence and responding to that within communities. And I think specifically within the work that you're doing as well, and a big focus from the CDC right now um, in sexual violence prevention work um, is thinking about health equity and social determinants of health, right? Um, so conditions and environments in which people are born, live, work, play, um, so at the community level, um, what is the built environment like, right? Um, is there access to education and job opportunities? Um, at the societal level, thinking about cultural attitudes, norms, um, policies, et cetera. So some I've already touched upon, I think, in some of the international work um, that I've talked about and kind of thinking about different kind of causes, et cetera. Um, and then kind of multi-sectoral responses, but this is really critical when we think about um, violence and violence prevention occurring within the socio-ecological framework, um, then thinking about risk and protective factors for this violence, and then what are some of the social determinants that are specifically in, in important to kind of think about um, as we develop um, sexual violence prevention efforts. Um, so then specifically thinking about, um, for example, in New Jersey, um, a few things I wanted to talk about here, and then I'll um, kind of open it up for questions, is the way that kind of strategies have, have come together is um, through, you know, a lot of evidence-based uh, review and work, um, the CDC which is kind of the main driver, I would say, of, of sexual violence prevention efforts um, nationally, um, has come to this focus on um, promoting social norms, so different strategies that specifically have been, I guess, proven to work in preventing sexual violence and gender-based violence, um, much of which is done with adolescents and young people. Um, and so some of these strategies are promoting social norms, and I mentioned that a lot, that protects against violence, um, providing opportunities to empower and support girls, creating protective environments, um, teaching skills to prevent violence, and then different approaches. And so how you know, this is kind of recommended for this type of application, I think whether you're a government or whether you're a community-based organization, et cetera, doing violence prevention work, is, and many of you might be familiar with this, is to follow um, this kind of public health approach of defining the problem, identifying the risk and protective factors, as I've mentioned, developing and testing prevention strategies, and then kind of adopting these prevention strategies with, of course, the entire goal, right? The entire goal to stop violence. Um, and so, you know, as a case study, for example, in New Jersey, you know, we really focused on kind of defining the problem 
Um, and this included having, you know, community, what we call community conversations and, and focus groups with um, culturally specific organizations, community-based organizations, sexual violence providers, et cetera, looking at publicly available data to really understand um, trends in crime, et cetera, to kind of understand risk and protective factors and kind of what issues were. Um, and then kind of once strategies were decided upon, um, specifically in New Jersey as kind of a case, again, as a case study, um, there's a major focus on engaging men and boys, um, both adolescents and young men, leadership opportunities for girls, um, really with a focus on adolescents and protective environments for LGBTQ plus community. And so um, from this, really talking to the communities and understanding like what are the major risk and protective factors that are related to violence that um, need to be a focus in prevention efforts. And again, this was really, you know, hearing from the community and having the community define themselves and then um, kind of implementing prevention efforts, um, which has um, been anywhere from curriculums to really like um, leadership empowerment strategies to doing needs assessment to understand um, kind of what are kind of protective um, frameworks that could be applied to specifically LGBTQ plus communities. And then kind of that's, I think, where we're in the case study, um, New Jersey is right now. And then, of course, widespread adoption of prevention strategies is something that, you know, everybody wants <laughs> at some point in, in life and in the future, but takes kind of a long time um, to get there. And so, you know, I think it's important to mention in kind of all of the work that I've talked about um, in, you know, this as an example of sexual violence prevention as um, the work that's been done in, in Benin um, and Malawi, et cetera, is that, you know, a lot of this discussion was um, kind of thought about pre-COVID, right? <laughs> and, and a lot of this work has continued um, in the pandemic, but I think this is really important to think about in how this has also changed how prevention and response work is done for gender-based violence and for prevention work um, that, you know, really um, has an impact on in-person programs versus digital programs as we think about health equity, um, kind of at all the kind of different examples I've talked about, how do people have even access to, to programs, um, you know, and that's, that can manifest itself very differently internationally than it does dom domestically, but there are some overlaps for sure. So, I mean, I'm sure you all have talked about this a lot, but there are just so many um, opportunities and challenges, I think, that the pandemic have created for gender-based violence response, prevention, thinking within an in-person environment approach, which I still think is super, super critical, but I think is really important. I don't think we have all the answers to think about um, as we think about this work moving forward. So I'll kind of open it up for questions, but also, um, I mean, maybe we can start off with thinking about, you know, in some, some of what I've talked about, how sexual violence response research and prevention apply to your own work with um, youth, young adults in kind of an interprofessional setting. You know, I think my first question was related to more about how do you think about kind of this so, so ecological or person environment framework within your work generally. Um, and, you know, many of you may not kind of work within gender-based violence or sexual violence, but it might um, relate in, in certain ways in thinking about sexual violence prevention. So we can kind of start off with that, or we can go to questions or a combination of all of those. And that's kind of the conclusion of my talk. So we can, we can uh, go from there. Thanks, Dr. Steiner. Yeah, so I'll, I'll open it up to folks and I'll um, also watch the chat as well if it's easier to enter it that way. But Eliza, I saw that you kicked us off with a, with a hand, so go for it. Thanks, yeah, so I work, um, well, I'm interning in an outpatient addiction treatment program. Um, it's mostly with young adults, but the amount of um, sex, history of sexual violence that we see is, astonishing. Um, so that's how it applies to my work um, <laughs> in short. And I think it's one thing that kind of just caught my attention, you know, just in, when I started and, and doing intakes is how, you know, we ask about history of um, 
you would talk about history of like domestic violence, not specifically sexual assault, but like it's asked about and then it's just kind of like, yes, no. And okay, next question on the intake, you know? And I think that, um, you know, obviously with, you know, discretion and, and clinical judgment, you don't kind of just yeah. like go on to the next one, but there's not really ex- um, explicit like protocol or guidelines for like, if someone brings it up just in the intake, which I, I just feel like is kind of surprising because um, uh, it's a, it seems like kind of a heavy thing to just um, put as another bullet point on the list of intake questions. Um, so that's kind of just what I wanted to share. No, I appreciate you sharing that. And, you know, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a clinician. I'll put that out there. So um, anything I say don't relate it clinically, but that is surprising, especially again. And that's why I said, like, I feel like a lot of this interprofessional work has to be like really suggested and thought about um, like how, you know, when those questions are asked, like you said, like, why is there not um, uh, thinking about a referral, right? Or like thinking about um, information about a referral or providing that information, which I would think, and I've, you know, worked in systems as a case manager, you know, were, that was part of our protocol to, in a certain extent. Um, and especially, I'm sure you see that a lot in, in those that you're working with. So that's just, again, I think thinking about the importance of kind of intersectoral and interprofessional work and how that's often missing in a lot of the domestic and international work that that's occurring. Yeah, I think that's a real challenge with um, substance use, substance abuse treatment is that it often with patients, it's kind of like, well, this needs to be addressed first, and then we can go into like mental health issues. But I think that yeah. like something like sexual violence, I mean, this is, and this is in, in the past, um, obviously if it's ongoing, then that would be different. Like, but it does seem like that, that's just something I struggle with in general with uh, substance use treatment is that it has to be so partialized and like, all right, let's tackle this first and then the other stuff. And I'm like, I don't know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So um, <laughs> I think that that's kind of where a lot of the mindset is with the intake. It's like, all right, we know all this, but first let's get you sober and then we'll deal with the other stuff. But yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And for sure. Yeah challenges yeah um I have something to share um yeah yes so um like I said earlier my placement is in foster care and like in my research I found that foster care doesn't really focus on preventative work they they focus more on like the here and now and they focus on protecting children in their current moment but they barely you know take the time to prepare the children that are in foster care for the future um but the program that I'm at the mother child program like they are working on helping the girls transition into uh, independent living and I think that's that's really important and that works towards the preventative care because the girls in the program are getting mental health services they're getting uh, services for them and their babies like health services insurance uh, money and other like clothes and things they need for them and their baby um and so it's also good that they're talking about like um contraceptives uh and like safe sex practices and things like that um but i guess I'm, I'm just curious on like uh like their mental, oh, like, I guess their mental health in the future as they're living on their own, like, what else can they do um, besides, like, what can, what else can they get to help to make sure that they heal from their trauma? Because a lot of the girls have survived, like, sexual violence, and because of that, their mental health is not the best. For example, one client at my program, uh, they describe her as being, like, sexually promiscuous because, she touches other people like inappropriately or says comments or wears revealing clothing. And I feel like the way that they describe her, I'm not sure if they're having like, you know, her past sexual violence trauma in mind when they're describing her in that way, because she might be like that because of what she's experienced because um, she was sexually trafficked by her birth family. And so that's really traumatizing and a big part of, you know, her mental health issues that she has today. So 
I'm just wondering like, what can I as a social work intern do further for young girls who have experienced sexual trauma like that? That's a heavy question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, one thing that comes to mind and I am certainly not an expert and, and I'm assuming you're pretty familiar with this, but is, is it for yourself in understanding like trauma informed approaches, right? And in working with other, other social workers and maybe caseworkers that you're, you're working with, um, because from what you're saying, I mean, um, yeah, kind of the responses um, may not be totally appropriate um, in terms of thinking about like the past history um, of trafficking, et cetera. Um, you know, and I think, you know, a lot of what I've been talking about is this kind of interprofessional um, work as well. So I don't know how much kind of in your placement that's 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 happening, um, you know, and so, I mean, it sounds like kind of the prevention education that's happening is really just is focused, which is fantastic on kind of more sexual health, but is not really related as much to trauma, which again, um, you know, I don't want to talk specifically from a clinical perspective, but um, from the work that I've done in case management and thinking about um, sexual violence experiences and systems, again, I just will continue to advocate for this like idea of multi-sectoral his historical responses and thinking about prevention and thinking about how do we work with, um, you know, other therapists, other experts, um, other kind of community members to like, to best kind of understand um, and respond to the specific experience um, and do it also. And, and again, um, thinking about like a strengths-based approach rather than kind of this shaming potentially is what I'm hearing from you, <laughs> which doesn't sound uh, great. Um, so I don't know if that, if that helps, but um, again, based on kind of what I'm talking about in my experience um, and thinking about kind of the work and the research that I've done specifically thinking about trafficking and sexual violence experiences, um, that is something that I think is just, you, you just constantly need to, to, to focus on particularly kind of from, um, sounds like you're doing more clinical work, but thinking of, again, like even like on a management and administrative ex ex like perspective, this is all working together, right? Like we can't just do this necessarily individually. How do we, um, how do we work with others, work with other systems um, to, and work with community um, in kind of understanding and thinking about staying away from stigmatization and focusing more on sensitivity and trauma-informed approaches. Does that help? Yeah, that does help a lot. I oh. I co-lead a, a group with the uh, case planner for all the girls. So I think that this is a conversation I could definitely have with her too. And we could try to have a topic about uh, sexual violence prevention. That would be amazing. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, I Thanks. see uh, a hand from, um, from Dr. Seely. I also wanted to just uh, shout out a question that came in the chat from Rico, um, which was your best um, or kind of your recommendations for societal interventions, um, despite the existing gap that you talked about in one of your slides. He wants to know if something like the Me Too movement is an example of a societal intervention, if there are others that you would point to. Did I respond to that before, Dr. Seeley? Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, for societal interventions, it's it's an excellent question. And I think um, specifically too, within sexual violence prevention work is um, still being trying to be figuring out, right? Like what, it, what are the best kind of societal and community level approaches to doing this type of work? Um, I think, you know, um, a lot of what the focus has been at, at the societal level, and I know I've mentioned this before, but like what this actually looks like is um, social norms change, right? And that a lot of that, um, you know, specifically in New Jersey and, and, and kind of trends that I, that I hear about nationally are thinking about media, right? So how do we understand and get particular messages for sexual violence prevention um, out in the media. Um, so that's one. Two, that's working a lot more closely 
with community leaders and um, like specific community-based and culturally specific organizations in having them work on con contextually um, on, you know, really having discussions about sexual violence, about beliefs, um, about what would it mean um, for sexual violence to end, et cetera. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, some of the work that's happening in New Jersey and other places has been working also with girls um, in thinking about empowerment, et cetera, um, and thinking about leadership. And so a lot of these are being considered kind of these community level um, social norm change versus a lot of kind of the individual level work that's been done on sexual violence prevention work on, which is not, it's not bad. It's just um, what's been done. And I think there's like a shift um, or to, to work more in tandem with individual and then community and social level. Um, individual work has been considered kind of curriculum level work. So like we implement a curriculum focused on sexual violence prevention. We have an understanding of what, what, what people's perceptions are before that curriculum and then think about what the changes are after. Um, but again, this idea is like, how do we work um, with community leaders? How do we think about things at a, at a greater level and a, at a more significant impact than just individual level change? So I hope that wasn't too abstract. I think that to be honest, that organizations, states and countries are still figuring this out, right? It's still like a work in progress. Um, and I don't think that there's one specific answer. And I think, you know, we've really seen that too. And, you know, I'm a researcher, I'm an evaluator. And I think what's just really interesting is there's a lot of research out there on um, not a lot, but like a good amount of research out there on like this kind of like more individual interpersonal sexual violence prevention or gender-based violence and specifically sexual violence prevention work. But there's so little out there on that community and societal level because programmatically and like impact wise, there's still trying, like we're still trying to figure it out. And then it's like, how do you even understand? How do you evaluate that? Right. How do you evaluate that change? Um, it's got to be something that's done like very much over time. You know, I think that there's different kind of media that's trying to be used to, to evaluate that, asking broader questions of communities. But I mean, especially for those of you who are interested in prevention work, um, in many ways, I think it's probably a very exciting time if you're interested in kind of sexual violence prevention to get involved because I think things are, are changing in a way for the better with a focus on community and societal level and also a huge shift in looking and thinking about, which we probably should have been doing the whole time, absolutely should have been doing the whole time in the domestic space on health equity, et cetera. So there's just a lot of change that's 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 going on. Um, and I think there's a lot of figuring out that that's trying to be done, but those are some examples of, of trends. Dr. Sealy, you have to play. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Steiner, I don't know if you are aware, but you are in the presence of some really, really solid developing practitioners. And I Dr. Ross, that. Dr. Ross, I don't know if you almost fell off your chair when Shania said, what about prevention? Because my agency doesn't cover prevention as much. And I, I say this to, to our fellows that we beam with pride when we hear you talk this way because it shows us it's coming together, it's gelling, it's landing. And so I feel very proud to hear this discussion right now. Um, to Shania's comment, I ended my IBH class yesterday. That was our last day last night. And we, our takeaway was, what are you taking away from this class? And so Eliza, if you feel that, you know, there's something not right about us not being able to care for a patient until they're sober or until certain benchmarks are met, then I encourage you in the most respectful, professional way to speak up. Your field instructor would welcome that conversation with you, or so it seems from when I met with them, and Shania, yours as well. 
you sit and educate that practitioner who may be flippantly saying something about what we know as practitioners to be signs and symptoms of uh, perhaps possibly signs and symptoms of someone who's experienced sexual trauma. So we can't be silent. We can't feel our hands are tied. We use what we've learned, not just in IBH, but in all of your courses, we integrate our learning experience and, and then we, we speak up and work to make those changes that we know are necessary. What does a client need to be healthy? We heard that yesterday. Some of you will hear it shortly. What does a client need to be healthy psychologically, physically, emotionally? And so go out there and do the work and change things. So I just wanted to, that was my two cents for tonight. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Olivine, yeah. I agree uh, with Dr. Sealy. I think um, most of the time our internships are unfamiliar places or spaces we're not used to being in. And there are times when we as interns see behaviors and it's up to us to bring it to our field work a supervisor and call it to their attention and say, you know what, this is not healthy towards our client or the community. And then they can implement changes and we can be a part of the change. So I definitely agree with what Dr. Seely brought up because it's so important in the learning process. I've learned that and I've seen in my internship because I've said certain things, certain things have changed and things have been implemented. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think it's kind of, sometimes it's hard, I think, as an intern, but um, your role as a, as a social worker, um, yeah, to be, to be talking about best practices for response, best practices for prevention. I mean, you're, that's why you're, you're in school, right? You're, you should be learning the kind of, I don't know, top-notch methods for, for all of this. So absolutely agreeing with, with Dr. Seely on that exciting that you've been able to enact some change too. So that's, that's really good to hear. Um, another question that came through the chat um, was asking you know, what you have learned from your non-social worker colleagues um, and kind of what have they learned from you as a social worker as you've kind of engaged in these prevention efforts. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think in the setting I'm in now, most of the kind of interprofessional work that's happening is public health and social work um, kind of coming together. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think that social workers really come from a social justice perspective, not saying that public health does not, um, but there's kind of a real emphasis on that within social work. And again, I think kind of both of the trainings come from kind of different or similar methodologies of the socio-ecological framework. So there's a lot of um, crossover there, but I think there's kind of a social justice perspective that as a social worker, um, I think I've often, we've often brought um, in terms of like a public health setting, um, thinking about um, kind of oppression in, in a hopefully a very critical way. Again, not saying public health does not, but it's just like on a different, different type of training. Um, and then thinking about kind of response um, beyond um, kind of working in tandem with systems, if that makes any sense. Um, I think one thing that I found really interesting is, you know, I come from an education background before kind of going into social work, which has been now like, I guess the majority of my career. Um, but, and again, I think like I explained, I came into social work because I felt like those discussions of beyond the education system weren't being discussed. And so I think um, a lot of learning that's happened is how those in the education field and not those just in the classroom, but who think about education at more of like a macro level can really be thinking about, again, different systems, different communities, families, et cetera. Um, and, you know, thinking about things from this like strengths-based perspective. And, um, you know, I think I've learned a lot. 
I think I learned a lot from public health methodology, from kind of the systematic um, kind of background <laughs> that public health comes from. Um, and again, those similarities in kind of the socio-ecological framework. Um, and then from education specifically, you know, really thinking about how curriculums and educational systems really have a, kind of an immense impact like on adolescents, et cetera. So, you know, I think, again, like I've said, social work, I think has brought to the table, and I'll just say it over and over, kind of that holistic perspective, that holistic perspective, that holistic perspective that is not, that I, that I, that I don't take for granted because having specifically, for example, come from the education world, there just isn't that thinking. Um, and so, you know, I think that there really has to be this constant focus on intersectoral and interprofessional work to make sure that, um, that that's occurring and that kind of that's, that's changing the way um, things are happening. Can I, uh, can I follow that up? That, that was my question. Um, I'm curious, uh, we have till seven, right? That's not my question, but we have till seven, just before seven. Okay. We do. Keep, uh, keep talking. I'm here. I just need to turn off my heat. I'm really hot. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so just thinking, I just really want to get practical. Um, and I would love if you could expound on your last answer with like an example that comes to mind where maybe you were at a meeting and you had to recenter the conversation out of your social work training. Like how, how, basically I'm asking, how, how do we know when, I, I guess for me, it's like we I've heard person and environment so much that it's hard for me to imagine at this point, like who is not thinking that way it makes so much sense, like, duh, right? Um, obviously, we know that's not the case, but I just like in this kind of academic space right now. So I'd love to know if you can, or, or if you can't, um, Dr. Steiner, any other like veteran here, uh, when you're at those interdisciplinary meetings and someone is not thinking holistically or person and environment or like through social justice? Like, how do you know that? How do you recognize that? And how do you recenter it uh, and bring that up and, you know, go to town? That's a good question. I mean, I, to be honest, I think I find it, I find it less in my current position, right? And again, because I think, um, and again, it's, it's public health and social work working together. And I mean, honestly, at the Department of Children and Families, it's a lot of social workers. So um, it's it's definitely less in kind of the work that, that I'm involved in in sexual violence prevention at the state. Um, kind of like I mentioned, I think this has occurred more in international work that I've done. Um, and to be honest, some of this was even before I got my social work degree, um, but I was already kind of thinking in that direction. Um, I mean, a lot of it I've seen literally, um, and this is even a little bit different than just an example of gender-based violence, but when I worked internationally, I worked in um, refugee work in Jordan, Jordan and Jordan, it's great. Um, and um, I was often at the table, I, I worked like on the ground a lot, but I also was often at the table with um, people from, you know, different sectors, right? And I mean, that's just a perfect example of like thinking, you know, you're working with these different like big actors at UNHCR, the, you know, refugee organization internationally, and they're thinking about how do we um, do something within an, an education system, and again, are not thinking about and like potentially violence that can occur and thinking about codes of conduct and curriculum change. And I found the same exact thing when I worked in, in, in other settings as well, um, both domestically and internationally kind of within education. And, and it's really focused on like, how do we just change the teacher's perceptions? How do we just change the co code of conduct? But we're not thinking about if a violence is occurring, how do we connect this adolescent girl to a social worker? Um, and so, I mean, I just can remember many inst instances in 
particularly when I worked more in the inner the education sector domestically and internationally, and um, in some of that, I guess, refugee response work in like when there was just this one answer of like, this is what we're going to look at on creating change and having to, to say and try to work with other programs um, and basically like make that argument about the need to um, have basically what to me it's referral networks, referral networks and creating those relationships with those other sectors, whether you're a case manager, um, when I was a case manager in Harlem, um, working with um, women, immigrants and refugees and needing to, to make that um, connection or working specifically within the education sector and saying, look, like, sure, we can have uh, discussions about codes of conduct with teachers, but we also need to think about like, what is, what are other connections that need to be made with faith leaders and, um, you know, social services to ensure that um, this girl is safe and, and has what she needs. And I, I mean, I was just, I've always just been astonished or I was astonished both United States and internationally that like those discussions are just not always happening. And some of it is just really thinking about, again, our training, our frameworks um, and thinking about how communities work, right? And how people work and we can't do the job, we can't do the job alone. So I don't know, I mean, I don't know if that's still too abstract, but like, I mean, that's what drove me to, to become a social worker and to stay committed to social work were like all of those kind of situations. And I think I've been happy in a way um, in my kind of current position that it, it seems to be a little bit more of the accepted, like, of course, okay. Like we, we think about this framework, this is how we should be doing prevention and response work. Um, you know, I think there's still siloing that's happening, but how do we work with different systems um, to make sure survivors get what they need and for um, prevention to work effectively? Does that help, Rico? Yeah, that's great. It's a big, I know it's a big, uh, it's a big topic, but thanks that a few of those sure. uh, examples were helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I know we need to, um, preserve just a few minutes at the end, but um, I think we have time for another kind of short or quick question, um, if anybody has anything else they wanted to add. All right. I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. I do. <laughs> no one else, sorry y'all. Uh, it's the time. So real quick, I was really curious, how did you land on 13 to 24 for your ages? I just would have assumed, I don't know, much younger to not 24. I, I don't know why. Um, I just was surprised that that was the specific age range. So, I mean, I have, you know, a specific background and interest in adolescents and young women, but to be honest, not honest, I mean, I was looking specifically at this data set that was the focus of the data set. So this is, um, it's fantastic. There's an organization called Together for Girls, which has a huge focus um, internationally on adolescent girls and young women. And so they work with, um, they're really committed to, to kind of a research-based approach to policy and prevention change um, in so many different countries around the world. And so part of that commitment is doing these surveys called the Violence Against Children surveys um, to kind of really understand the experiences, uh, uh, numerous gender-based violence experiences and um, some experiences of health, mental health, physical health. And it's really some of the only data that's out there that is so incredibly detailed about kind of the gender-based violence experiences of adolescent girls within that age range. Um, and also, I mean, so it was driven by kind of my interests and then specifically like with um, this specific data set. But when we think about adolescence and um, kind of that definition, definition, at least like on an international level, that's often the age range that is quoted um, is kind of that 13 to 24, like adolescents and young people. I know sometimes like, I feel like that narrative is a little different, maybe domestically, but when we think about like international 
I don't know, research definitions, et cetera. 13 to 24 is like adolescents and young women. It's like how that's kind of operationalized in terms of um, a focus on that population. All right. Well, thank you so much. Did you, were you preparing to, to jump in, Abby, and close us, close us off, or did you need me to help with your bandwidth? I will try, because <laughs> I'm having lots of internet connectivity issues today, so I apologize. Um, I can jump in if you need, uh, yeah. But I do want to say thank you um, uh, to Dr. Steiner. I think this was an incredible presentation. You really brought together so many of the things that we've been talking about um, this semester um, in our integrated behavioral health class. Um, and I loved your focus um, on such a, a topic that we, I think we traditionally think of as a very clinical topic, right? Uh, violence, sexual violence, um, and these types of things. And you really brought in the importance of prevention, social determinants, and a population health approach if we're ever really going to get um, to health equity. So thank you, thank you. I see thank Dr. Seal, you have your hand up. Yes, just a quick announcement, please folks, please continue to work on submitting all of your documentation. Your mid-year evaluations are due this week. So please just take an, another look at the email I sent you for those. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steiner also. Thank you so much. We really enjoyed having you here. Thank I just you. popped the survey into the chat. Um, I, I really could not think of a better way to close out our first semester of Pipeline for Youth Health. This is the perfect transition um, because while everybody took integrated behavioral health and social work practice this semester, they're going into health policy and advocacy next semester. So Fantastic. Um, uh, in terms of the examples that you offered and the way to really think about um, using systems um, uh, to, to force change because um, it doesn't just happen on its own. Thank you so much so, for having me. It's been an honor. Thank you. It's been an honor for us as well. So everybody, please grab that survey link. I will also send out an email. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all. Actually, I'm coming, uh, I'm coming to your seminar next week uh, briefly. Uh, so I will see you then. Dr. Steiner, thank you so, so much. Um, really, really appreciate it. And um, hopefully we will be able to have you back. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope so.